it's not really CO2 that's doing a lot for climate. It's clouds. Clouds make a very big difference to climate change. My guest today is Robert Ian Holmes from Australia. I left school at 16 and mostly worked for myself, but had quite a few different jobs until I got into my 50s. I did a, a degree in astronomy first, and then I did a degree in mining engineering, and then I did a master's in um, environmental engineering. Finally, just recently, a PhD in uh, climate science slash mitigation. I didn't think I'd do that after the master's was quite difficult, but Anyway, uh, we got through it, and there we are. What was it like being a, uh, a student in climate science as a climate skeptic? Was that a hard thing to do? Yeah, quite difficult. Uh, because I got the mining engineering degree, I went into um, underground uh, coal mining, and I was uh, working there for a few years. And uh, I did some work on cutting greenhouse gas emissions, it wasn't really part of my job. I just did it for something to do, you know, a bit of extra work. Soon after that, the um, climate tax came in. Uh, this is 2012. I did go to a conference in Colorado, actually, as part of that, as part of the PhD, uh, and uh, presented a conference there, how to cut greenhouse gas, uh, gas emissions from uh, underground coal mines. That was part of it. I was I was always interested uh, for a long time in, in the climate change and greenhouse gases and so on and trying to work it all out. It's a lar it's a large and complicated field, as you know. In the end, I uh, recently published some papers on on climate change, greenhouse gases, and so on. There's three recent ones starting in 2017, which we'll get to later on. But anyway, as my uh, as my slide here says, my PowerPoint slide, hoping to bring reason and some empirical science into the climate debate. That's what I'm hoping to do. A lot of it seems to be muddling, and uh, people just don't get it. You know, how can you predict uh, the climate in a hundred years' time? It just uh, for a lot, a lot of people, it doesn't add up uh, when it's difficult to predict. Uh, weather, for example, a week in front. This is just some, some uh, my, my personal opinion, but science and reason has been abandoned. Forces are lying. Some are convinced that the danger of a climate catastrophe is so great that not only is it reasonable to dispense with the scientific method, but with reason and decency as well. And we've, we've seen a lot of evidence of that. But I believe that the opposite is true. If the potential danger is so great, then the scientific method must be adhered to even more rigorously. Only then will we have the knowledge to be able to follow the correct course of action. We'll just go into climate cycles to start with, because although it's not in any IPCC report, um, the climate for both past and present is dominated by climate cycles. I've identified 16, 16 main ones. Unfortunately, the only climate cycle that they have in any IPCC reports is the schwa. Of course, they say that it has basically no effect. It goes up and down and doesn't really have any effect long term on long term climate change. It increases the temperature over the 11 year cycle by maybe 0 0.05 degrees and then down again the same. So it has no net, net effect on climate change. There's other climate cycles that are much more important to us at the moment when we're considering climate change and, and global warming and so on. And the problem is the IPCC does not recognize any of these climate cycles, as I said, except one, the Schwab, but they're definitely there. Now, this is the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation. This is how the oceans warm and cool, in the, uh, in the, mostly in the northern Atlantic. And 1880 was a warming... 1910 are cooling, 1940s are warming, and now we're in the warming cycle again. This is obviously a climate cycle, and it's the Yoshimura climate cycle, 60, 60 to 62 year Yoshimura. They took, up, took data from the last 100 years from all the uh, stations in all these countries. So it's a worldwide temperature graph. But because they've taken only ocean as sheltered thermometer stations, it shows no effect from the oceans, which have been warming. So this temperature graph shows that the, the land is not really warming at all. 
again, we see this 60-year Yoshimura climate cycle, and in it the Schwab as well. They seem to be getting rid of these climate cycles, which are still in the Hadcrut Had uh, 3 uh, data, which does end a little bit, you know, before the present time because they stopped and moved to Hadcrut 4 and Hadcrut 5. Here we've got the Hadcrut 4. This is a 50-year annual trend. Uh, so instead of having a yearly trend, if you turn it into a 50-year trend, it, it reveals underlying climate cycles. This is, again, the 60-year climate cycle we've been talking about. This had group four from the Arctic. Usually when, I'll call them CO2 proponents, when the CO2 proponents show you a chart, they started in the, in the 1970s here. They only show you the warming part, but they ignore the past where it's been as warm or warmer in the Arctic as it is now. So... So as you see here from the Hadcrook 4 chart going back to 1920, uh, you'll see that it was warm in the 1930s and 40s, war as warm as now, if not warmer. Again, we're seeing that 60-year climate cycle very prominent in the data. Longer term, it should go back a 1,000 years. We see the bond cycle. So it, it peaked in about 1,100, uh, and it's peaking ag again now in 2000. So this is a 1,000-year bond cycle. In between, we have other climate cycles, which is this 240-year roughly Swiss climate cycle. Is that in there as well? If we look at uh, the last thousand years of non-tree ring proxy data, uh, we're going back beyond the thermometer record now. This is work by Lowell in 2007, which showed the last 2,000 years. Here we'll start about AD0 and and then we've got the Dark Ages, which was cooler. Uh, we've got the medieval warm period. Uh, and then we've got the Little Ice Age, and what I'll call the current warming period. This is, again, the thousand-year bond cycle. Very prominent in the data. Now, this temperature reconstruction goes back about two and a half thousand years. This one's from China. So you can see that these climate cycles worldwide. The CO2 proponents are always saying, oh, there, this was just in the uh, North Atlantic or something, or the Northern Hemisphere, or the Southern Hemisphere. You know, they, they say that these climate cycles were, were just local, but they were actually worldwide. Here again, we've got the thousand-year bond cycle and the other shorter-term cycles in between. This is from Lou 2011. He's expecting a fall in temperature, slight fall, not a severe fall in temperature until the year 2068 and then a rise again. Okay, going back a bit further, we're going back 10,000 years now, we see longer climate cycles begin to emerge. The 2,300-year Bray climate cycle. Go back a lot further, so if we go back 5 billion years, that's what we see in the last million or years or so, we see 100,000-year Cycles of ice ages going in and out of ice ages severely for the last 100,000 years. You talk about climate changes, that's real climate change. That is, it's not, it's not like what's happening now, which is nothing compared to that. You got the range in temperature of 10 degrees uh, from warming to cooling. Where we are is about here. For the last million years, you had a 41,000 year climate cycle. This comes from sediment cores over the last 500 million years. And here is found that there's a 32 million year climate cycle. They all piggyback on each other. What's the cause of this 32 million year climate cycle? Is that the solar system orbits the Milky Way once every 250 million years, as you probably know. But also at the same time, it goes up and down through the disk of the Milky Way uh, like a dolphin, I suppose, every 32 million years. It causes cooling and warming periods in, in the Earth's climate on the, on the 32 million year cycle. This is to do with clouds, and we'll come to that. Uh, it's cosmic rays causing clouds. So when you get more cosmic rays, you get more clouds, you get a cooler climate. You get less cosmic rays, you get less clouds, you, you get a warming climate, which is what we've got now. Uh, going back further, 500 million years here, uh, 
again, on these time scales, there's no relationship between CO2 really and, uh, and temperature. And here you can see the large-scale climate cycles we're talking about. Uh, you get ice ages, and these are related to the passage of the solar system through spiral arms. So it's a 140 million year cycle. So when the solar system goes through a spiral arm, that causes cooling. Now, we're in an ice age now, and uh, we're in the um, Orion spiral arm segment. We're passing through that right now, and that has caused the climate to cool. That's why we're in the, the present ice age. Okay, now we'll look at a bit of data uh, about CO2, which shows that there's no warming from CO2. This is a paper published by Clark and Ian Carno. And they took measurements from the atmosphere. This is the important part here. That, that's in the troposphere. That's uh, that's 10 kilopascals at pressure. So this is this bottom part of the graph is the troposphere. And in the emission, uh, absorption emission spectrum for CO2, you see there's no effect. But there is, from more CO2, there is warming <laughs> higher up in the atmosphere. In the mesosphere and the stratosphere, there's warming. But in the troposphere, there's nothing. There's no effect. All the models, all the computer projections said that there must be a hotspot. A hotspot must develop over the tropics at about 12 kilometers in height. So in, so in the upper troposphere, uh, the troposphere is about 18 kilometers in the, high in the, uh, in the tropics. This is, What this is, it's a slice through uh, the atmosphere from uh, the North Pole to the South Pole. And going upwards, this is over the troposphere here. That's the equator. So all these models, if CO2 greenhouse warming exists, there must be a hot spot developing. But this is the data. This is measurements of the atmosphere after a lot of CO2 has gone into the atmosphere, anthropogenic CO2. So these weather balloons have measured the temperature and there's, it's completely flat. So greenhouse gas theory says that there must be a hot spot over the tropics, and there also must be warming at each pole. But this is the data, and it shows there's been warming in the Arctic, no hot spot over the tropics, and cooling in the Antarctic. Historically, CO2 has lagged any change in temperature. So if you look at the ice core proxies, temperature changes, and then about 80 years later, CO2 changes when... The climate cools, CO2 follows it down ancient several hundred years later. There's also an effect on shorter term scales. This graph is um, a recent one, as you see here from the day. It shows that the, in blue here, we've got the ocean temperature change, changing slightly. And the green is CO2, which again is following, um, in this case, it's following 11 months later. There's a slight change in ocean temperatures. And then there's a slight change in the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. This is to do with Henry's law. When the oceans get warmer, they release CO2. When they get cooler, they absorb CO2. So again, it's CO2 is not the driver, it's, it's the effect. Most of the warming in that warming Earth is the ocean warming. You know, the atmosphere is relatively small and follows on from the oceans. There's a problem here for the greenhouse effect because uh, they said that the warming is coming from CO2. According to the IPCC, it's 98%. 98% of all warming since 1750 and climate changes, 98% is supposed to come, be coming from greenhouse gases. The greenhouse effect, according to the IPCC, that's what their attribution states from their work in Group 1. Now, there's a problem there because um, radiation, like back radiation from CO2 in the atmosphere, long wave radiation, cannot penetrate the ocean, so it cannot heat the oceans. This is, this is the main emission band uh, for CO2, about, it's about 15, 14, 15 uh, microns. Uh, and this shows the absorption of water of the ocean to uh, to radiation. Down here is where uh, the oceans are heated by shortwave radiation from the sun. 
So shortwave radiation from the sun can penetrate the oceans, as you say, down to, I don't know, 100 meters. But longwave radiation from CO2 cannot penetrate the ocean. It's, it's only a few microns. It's just touching the surface. So that's more likely to cause cooling than warming the oceans because it will cause evaporation. So that doesn't work. Now, when you compare the, the planets, you got Venus, Earth, and Mars here, for example. Now, the CO2 absorption bands between the three planets are very similar despite the obvious differences in CO2 levels. So you've got 96% CO2 in the Venus atmosphere, 95% Mars, and only 0.04% CO2 on Earth. And even if you count all greenhouse gases on Earth, it's only 2.5%. We have a dearth of greenhouse gases on Earth, and yet the absorption bands from all three planets are the same. Very similar. So this means that the absorption band for CO2 on Earth is already saturated. So you can't get any more warming, basically, from adding CO2 to the atmosphere. We'll have a look at CO2 now, CO2 levels. This is a graph which shows GISP2, um, the proxy for temperature from uh, Greenland, over the last 11,000 years, as you see there. So this is really the entire Holocene. So the early Holocene was very warm, as you see here, and it started to cool about 3,000 years ago. And uh, uh, we, again, we've got the climate cycles, like I was speaking. You've got the 1,000-year bond cycle, the Minoan warm period there. We've got the Roman warm period, uh, the medieval warm period, and the current warm period. And here we've got... Uh, Atmospheric CO2 from uh, the Epicodome sea ice cone. No correlation at all. In fact, it's the opposite. That's according to the ice core CO2 record. There are problems with that, and we'll come back to that. Plants lose CO2 because CO2 is plant food. So you give rice, for example, more CO2, grows better. Current levels about here, rice is growing pretty well. But you double the CO2 level, they grow even better. And the same with mast plants. This is another one here. This is Dr. Red Sale with his son, did a bit of research into this some time ago. That's the ambient levels of CO2. This is show, showing a Christmas tree growing. With 150 parts per million extra CO2, the tree grows better. With 300 parts per million extra grows even better with 450 parts per million extra, basically doubling what we've got now. Grows even better than ever. Twice as grows twice as high as it does with ambient CO2. So and CO2 historically has never been bad for life. So it's uh, when you look back over historical periods, CO2 is about the lowest now it's ever been in the Earth's history. It's pretty close to an extreme low. So why why someone should fear the level of CO2 being a little bit high, I'm not quite sure. It seems to be, you know, widespread. The CSI recently published a paper that was done at year that works there, and he found that the Earth is greening due to the extra CO2 in the atmosphere, which we humans have probably put a lot of it up there. But the question is, is it a bad thing or a good thing? How bad are the bad things associated with it and how good are the good things associated with it? Well, CO2 fertilization has caused the deserts to green in places, particularly in the southern fringe of the Sahara there. You've had a lot of uh, new plant growth and uh, the extra plant growth for crops has meant that you could feed 500 million more people just just through CO2 fertilization. So I think that's a good thing. There is a problem with the ice core CO2. And when you compare to other proxy CO2 um, data, such as from plants to matter, there's a difference, as I'll explain. Oh, first, we'll just have a look at this. The CO2 proponents always say, oh, the CO2 level is high. It's higher than it's been. For millions of years, they often say that, but they're they're relying on the uh, ice core CO2 data exclusively. Now, if you look at other proxies for CO2, for example, 
uh, Hare from Kuhnberg's 2004 PhD thesis. He found that uh, using plants to matter, the, the um, CO2 levels was actually as high or higher than now just 1,500 years ago. That's the present, and that's uh, 500 AD. So the one problem is with universities is that they don't like you to say the wrong thing. So Kuhnberg, before he, he got his PhD thesis approved, he had to cut the chart off here and discard this data. It was deemed to be inconvenient. These dots here are the CO2 um, ice core data. They're approved. You can publish that, but when you publish something like this, it's not approved. Here we've got uh, a paper by Stein's daughter, published in 2013. It directly compares the uh, ice core CO2 data with other um, proxy CO2 data from plants. Here you've got the ice core. If you notice the scale, the range of the ice core data over this period, which is uh, 14,000 to 11,000, a thousand years before present. So it's about about 3,000 years, this proxy data. The range of the ice core data is only 20 parts per million, as you'll see from the scale. But the plant's tomato range is, if you look at the scale, is much greater. It's about 245 parts per million, the range from the high to the low. With uh, plant's tomato CO2, it says that the CO2 is going up and down enormously but the ice core um, proxy data says no CO2 is low and monotonic, flat. So there's a big difference there. So we have to think, oh, well, why is that the case? It's due to the constant diffusion effect. So once uh, once the CO2 goes into the fern, into the ice, it gets snowpack on top of it, it gets compressed, that compression causes uh, a change in the CO2 that's in the ice. Once it gets under an enormous amount of pressure, the more pressure it gets under, the more problem you've got. You, you get a flatter and a lower CO2 level than, than you do from other CO2 proxy data. Uh, we'll have a look at cosmoclimatology. Uh, it was Henrik Svensmark who was mainly doing this. Satellite data, you at UHMSU, just from 1979 to the present, you'll see a, slow, a slightly rising temperature graph. At the same time, you've got global cloud cover, and it fell about 2% over the globe over this period, the same period. So when you got less cloud cover, you get higher temperatures. Well, it's, it's very logical, really. Uh, more, more solar energy hitting the ground and oceans, heating them. Uh, and so you get warming. If you've got more cloud, you'll get a cooler climate. Uh, this is basically what Svensson said. So it's it's not really CO2 that's doing a lot for climate. It's clouds. Clouds make a very big difference uh, to climate change, to climate temperatures and climate change. And they have a lot to do with climate cycles as well. Where's the evidence? This plot is a total cloud cover versus global surface air temperatures. So the plot clearly shows that when you get more cloud cover, you get cooler global temperatures. So it's temperatures on this side, cloud cover across the bottom. And what this is, it's, it's around about 0 0.06 degrees centigrade for every 1% change in cloud cover. Now, between... 1980 and um, to the year 2002, um, temperatures went up about 0.4 degrees centigrade according to uh, global temperature data. But at the same time, low tropical cloud fell by six uh, six percent. So six times 0 0.06 percent. That's about the entire temperature rise that we experienced in the late late uh, 20th century it can be attributed to cloud changes for example here okay so we've got global surface temperatures here this is hard group three slow rise from the 80s early 80s to the 2000s 
2000s, and then flat. Cloud cover, this is tropical cloud cover, low cloud cover. You've got a big fall in cloud cover over that period from around about 16, 6, 67% down to about 60%, which has caused this warming. That warming was caused by the falling tropical cloud cover. And then the cloud covers flat after that, setting the temperatures. No need for CO2. Now, we'll get back to cosmoclimatology, which is to do with cosmic rays impacting uh, the Earth, Earth's climate via cloud changes. So it's not just that there's more or less cloud due to uh, cosmic ray changes, cosmic ray flux changes. It impacts albedo as well as having less cloud cover and more so more sunshine. So, for example, in the late 20th century, you've got less solar activity. So the CO2 proponents say, oh, well, it can't be the sun. You can't have warming from the sun when there's less, uh, less solar activity. But of course you can. If there's less clouds, then you get more, more uh, solar energy to the surface, to the oceans and the land, even if the solar activity is a little bit less. So you can get warming from the sun. Uh, when there's less solar activity. It depends on the cloud cover changes. So that's something that they sort of forget about. Now, now what these cosmic rays are, well, most of them are protons. So the relativistic protons coming in at high velocity from generally from outside the solar system, from events such as uh, supernova and so on, cosmic events, now, it's the high-energy protons. When they hit the upper atmosphere, they cause a shower of muons right through the uh, atmosphere, right to the surface. And these ca can cause uh, cloud generation, so they can create clouds. So you get more cosmic rays uh, of the right uh, intensity or right, right strength, then you can get more clouds and so on, or less clouds depending on on the intensity of the cosmic rays. So, and you can see the dates here. And there's a strong correlation, causative correlation between uh, changes in cosmic rays and cloud generation, so on temperatures. Uh, in this graph, the effects of vol volcanoes and El Ninos have been removed. So, there's an excellent correlation between global temperatures and cosmic rays. In the case of cosmic rays, it's causative relationships. So the cosmic rays cause changes in clouds that cause changes in temperatures and climate. Whereas CO2, as you know, is the opposite. It's always in effect. It just doesn't cause anything. Okay, here we've got another a more work by Kirk in 2002, which shows the galactic cosmic ray flux falling. Uh, now, the coldest temperature in the whole Holocene in the last 10,000 years was the, was the Little Ice Age. And see, the peak of the low in the Little Ice Age was in 1690, which is up here. It's, this graph is inverted. So that was the coldest temperature when you got the most galactic cosmic rays impacting on Earth because they were generating more cloud. Here you've got climate cycles appearing again in this. As the sun changes its intensity, uh, the sun causes a few of these climate cycles. It changes the cosmic ray flux that impacts the Earth because the, push, the sun pushes the cosmic rays away. And when the sun is stronger and the sun is weaker, it lets more cosmic rays impact the Earth and so the Earth's climate cools. As you can see, the last 200 years has been a strong uh, fall in the galactic cosmic ray flux. And this is because uh, solar activity has increased. Over the last, uh, the late 20th century was the strongest solar activity for thousands of years. But we'll come back to that. The sunspots, which is a proxy of solar activity, determines your cosmic ray count, or how much cosmic rays impact the Earth. And uh, you know, how that changes the cloud color. So really, it's clouds that are, that are driving a lot of climate changes. Here we've got proxy cosmic ray flux and proxy temperatures. So the, the oxygen-18 isotopes are proxy for temperature. 
and the carbon-14 isotopes are proxy for real uh, solar activity, really, in cosmic ray flux. And, of course, it's the um, CRF, the, cos- the solar activity, that is driving the temperature on Earth, not vice versa. The temperature on Earth can't drive solar activity. Now, just expanding on that theme a little bit, going back, what, 60 million years, we got the Earth's optimum here about 50 million years ago, and then the climate cooled. Then we got we had the Antarctic glaciation that was about 33 million years ago, and, and the Antarctic first. Before that, there was no ice at either pole through the, throughout this entire period. The Earth was much warmer than it is now. Now this just didn't happen as an accident, and it was nothing to do with CO2. It was the cosmic rays, as I said, and the, the solar system's passage through um, through these spiral lines up the uh, Milky Way, which causes more cosmic rays because the spiral lines are density waves that move around the Milky Way, and those density waves compress gas uh, gas clouds and cause stars. So you get a lot of new stars forming, thousands of new stars forming. High-mass stars uh, go supernova pretty quickly, only last a few million years, and then they go supernova, and you get a burst of cosmic rays, high-intensity cosmic rays, exactly the sort of cosmic rays that bypass the sun, uh, the sun trying to keep them away, and they uh, cause uh, ice ages on Earth and cooling on Earth. So this is what you have here. So the Antarctic cooled about 30 odd million years ago, and then it thawed, it got warmer. And then about 15 million years ago, the Antarctic re-glaciated. But this was a starburst, a very strong starburst. It correlates with that strong about 15 million years ago. And then the climate cooled again. Three million years ago, we had another powerful starburst which sent us into the current ice age, and this is where we are now, down here. Very, very cold. The last three million years, the Earth has been very, very cold, far colder than it's been for a long, long time. So to fear one or two degrees of warming is a little bit strange, to say the least. It shows that starbursts correlate with proxy records, the ice ages and climate changes on Earth. So but the Aris effect, really. There's a strong negative feedback in evidence. How, how do we know that? When the outgoing uh, radiation falls, uh, when, the, when the iris closes, that causes less outgoing, higher, lower, lower radiation, sorry, and causes the climate to warm. But when once the climate has warmed quite a bit, that causes the iris to open again and let the long wave radiation out. You can see it just there. It's a strong negative feedback. So the climate, this warming and cooling, is uh, is controlled by this uh, this outgoing, really, really by the Aris effect. The CO2 proponents always show this type of graph. They say, oh, well, shortwave radiation comes in from the sun and the Earth emits lower, lower radiation. This type of graph is very misleading because it shows that the sun has no low-wave radiation. That's just, just not true. Our atmosphere is thermalized by low-wave low radiation from the sun, as well as from the Earth. So as well as upwelling low-wave radiation, we've got downwelling low-wave radiation coming directly from the sun. So this graph is very misleading. This is a more accurate graph, which so it shows the solar black body radiation totally encompasses the Earth's black body radiation. So the, the sun has far more um, long wave radiation coming from it than Earth has, but they don't show that. So we've got long wave, long wave radiation coming down from the sun that already thermalizes the Earth's atmosphere and all the greenhouse gases. So you get, you get them Totally, totally restricting their any in, 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 increase in their in their activity. So it's a little bit misleading to say that the sun is short wave and the Earth is long wave. No, the sun is all wavelengths, long wave and, and short wave. 
said about the polls, now the current snow cover last year was massive. There's no no reduction in snow cover at all. So this is a record of uh, snow cover kept by Rutgers University from the early 70s, and basically it's flat. Uh, the minimum is really flat, but it does vary a little bit. It could have a little bit to do with black carbon. So if you've got a lot of a lot of uh, power stations like they have in China putting out uh, black carbon aerosols, that could cause a, a bit of temporary uh, melting of, of snow, but uh, it's, it's not permanent. Once those uh, power stations have been replaced by modern power stations, there shouldn't be a problem there uh, with the black carbon. CO2 itself doesn't really do anything. It's a Hadcrook 4 Arctic uh, temperature graph, which shows it was just as warm in the 30s and 40s as it is right now. So it's just a cycle. This is Greenland temperatures, just normal climate cycles. The Antarctic, if you've got global warming, uh, it would have to be the whole glo globe, but the Antarctic hasn't warmed. Apart from the science of climate, there's also the economic side of, of climate science. Will warming be a benefit or will it be something bad for the economy? Well, according to Professor Toll, who published this this data in, from his paper in 2009, he calculated there's the net economic benefit to warming up to 2.2 degrees centigrade. So that's the economic benefit, and that's uh, an economic loss uh, once it gets over 2.2 centigrade. But that, that temperature is from current levels. So according, that's, yeah, from 2009 levels. So according to the IPCC, it's been warming since 1750 due to CO2. 0.8 degrees. So when you add that to this, it's 3 degrees centigrade. So there's a net economic benefit up to the IPCC level of uh, 3 degrees centigrade of warming, which we're very far from. Uh, even according to them, it's only 0.8 degrees. Well, look at the sun, the uh, TSI from the sun and short term climate cycles. You can see that it was warm in the late 1700s. And it cooled to about 1900, and then it's warmed again now. So this is a climate cycle. All the cities show the same V-shaped uh, cooling and warming. And this is the Swiss climate cycle, 248-year-long uh, cycle. So uh, Ludecki identified these five climate cycles from the data. The most prominent one is that one. 248 Swiss climate cycle, and uh, the 80-year Gleisberg and the 61-year Yoshimura, these, these are short-term climate cycles. And when he fitted the climate cycles to the data, he got an exact match. It's no warming from CO2, Neptune warming and brightening. This is Earth's uh, mean temperature anomaly, and this is TSI. As you can see, the the correlate with each other fairly well. So and we've got similar things happening on Pluto. So the planets are, are experiencing global warming as well. Now here we've we've got this. This is quite important. During uh, during the Earth's orbit of the Sun, the orbit is slightly elliptical. So it's not circular. You get different levels of TSI during the year as the, as the Earth orbits the Sun, of course because we're slightly further from the sun in June and July, the northern summer. And in the southern summer, you know, sort of December, January, we're a little bit closer. The difference is in TSI is quite big. It's about 90 watts per square metre top of atmosphere. And on the surface, it's 15 watts per square metre. That is an enormous change. Uh, it's, it's actually a thousand times more than the alleged change in forcing from CO2. But this is over a six months time period. So the, the forcing changes naturally. This is due to the eccentricity. Between July and January, you get that 15 watts per square meter extra at the Earth's surface. But from, from CO2, they're alleged two watts per square meter since 1750. So 270 years 
you, you can see the difference there. So natural cloud, na natural forcings, just that one natural forcing is a thousand times greater than the alleged CO2 forcing. And yet the Earth temperature doesn't change radically over that six months. Why not? Well, it's because of clouds. Again, it's negative feedback. He showed that uh, between the northern and southern hemisphere, the eccentricity, although it's a very big change in, uh, in TSI at the surface over just a six-month period, makes no difference to the um, global temperatures or the uh, because the clouds make up for it. If the clouds can make up for 15 watts per square meter over a six-month period, they can make up for a lot more than that if CO2 does cause any forcing. What it did in this paper was um, it took the solar cycles from solar cycles 1 to 8, which are these ones in red, shifted them forward 211 years, and they match up pretty well with the current uh, solar cycles. These, these ones in black are the current solar cycle. We've got the strongest one in 1960. As I said, the late 20th century, which is these these uh, five climate, uh, five solar cycles here, that was the strongest solar activity for thousands of years. If you're, if you're talking about the cause of warming, that would be a real cause of warming. Anyway, the, this, what I found was that these uh, first eight climate cycles match up pretty well to the current ones, which tells you that this uh, might be just... Again, a cycle, but a longer term cycle that's happening with the so with the uh, TSI changes over the Schwab. So you can even predict slightly. Prediction is difficult, but you can say why well, we might have a bit of cooling over the next uh, you know thirty forty years. This is a paper by the deck in two thousand eleven, uh, 11, which shows the sunspot numbers. Over the last two thousand years, uh, there was obviously this is proxy data, so you got a slow reduction in sunspot numbers until you get to the late sixteen hundreds when there was zero sunspot numbers for quite a few, a couple of decades, not visible on the sun at all. So that was the solar minimum. And then you got a sudden massive increase in uh, solar activity since basically. 1700. So over the last 330 years, we've had a massive increase in solar activity. The current solar activity is the highest for 11,000 years. This uh, graph, as you see, goes back 11,000 years. So the last similar uh, solar maximum to what we've got now was 11,000 years ago. It was a grand maximum. And now we have a, another, uh, we had a grand minimum in the uh, Little Ice Age. More evidence that uh, solar activity has climbed enormously since the late 1600s, which was the peak of the Little Ice Age. This is work by Sammy in 2009, which shows the inverted scale of orbital angular, angular momentum of the planets in the sun. Again, we see in this data climate cycles. You've got the 1,000-year bond climate cycle. So I think it's now 134 years, but we'll call it 1,000. So that's the current time there. This is the year, just after the year 2000. That's where we are. This is inverted. So when when it goes when it goes up, that's cooling, and when it goes down, that's warming. So now remember, this is a thousand year cycle and one cycle, and in between we've got all these shorter cycles. Uh, mostly prominent here is the Yoshimura 61 year solar cycle. So. We're right at the peak now. Uh, this is an inverted graph. So we're right at the peak of the warming now. Uh, the peak of the cooling was here in 1690, the coldest in the last 10,000 years. Uh, now we've got a warm period. but it's, it's definitely not the warmest in the last 10,000 years, but it's, it's warmer than it's been for about 300 years. So we've had global warming since 1690. So for the last 330 years, we've had global global warming, the natural period of global warming. Several major solar cycles, uh, climate cycle and climate cycles, sort of mixed up together and uh, showing why we're where we are now. 
uh, this is where we are now, just after the year 2020 there, about here. And we're following um, we're following this graph. That's that's uh, minimum temperatures here in the 60, late 1600s, and warming to where we are now. It's going to keep generally about the same direction. Why it's warmed over the last hundred years is due to the underpinning by the uh, eddy cycle and the Bray, the longer term Bray cycle. Eddy cycle, or well, bond cycle, some people would call it. All these climate cycles piggyback on each other. Where we had the, had the underlying warming trend the last few hundred years is because of these longer term underlying climate cycles. We've got roughly from the greenhouse gases, we've got roughly two watts, just over two watts per square meter since 1750. Now, they say that the solar irradiance plus all natural climate changes are just down here in this little tiny bit. You can hardly see that's 0.05 watts per square meter since 1750. Why so small? Why is that so tiny? We'll come to that. I'll do proponents also claim that 2,000 top scientists worked on the IPCC's reports. Well, the only scientists who matter are those who work on W uh, Working Group One, which is which deals with attribution. What caused the global warming we're experiencing now? In AO five, there's two hundred and fifty five of them who worked in Working Group One, but but only eighteen of them worked on attribution. In other words, the whole IPCC document report uh, rests on these eighteen people, not thousands, eighteen. And several several of them were students at the time. Three of them were still students at the time the report was made. Uh, and many of them, uh, because of the political nature of the IPCC, many of them were chosen from third world countries, not for their long experience in climate science. So just a handful of uh, climate scientists, maybe half a dozen, determined the IPCC report from start to finish, because attribution is everything. Attribution determines climate sensitivity, and that determines all the working groups, one, two, and three, what happens going through. This is another reconstruction that the IPCC doesn't use. They said, oh, from 1750 to now, there's been no change in TSI. They're not far from being accurate, but they're ignoring all this. And look at the range. So the peak low is about, let's say, 1353, peak high 3063. So you've got at least 10 watts per square uh, meter of TSI range here. But the IPCC said, no, it's only one and a half watts per square meter range in TSI because they're ignoring all this uh, past data. This is another... Proxy TSI from someone else instead, which shows something similar to the last graph. It's, it is, could have a 1700, but I don't think that's deliberate. 1690 was even lower, about 1354 watts per square meter. So if you start from 1354 and go to the present, you've got at least seven watts per square meter of rise. And that is a lot. It's definitely more than any alleged CO2 promising. It makes a big difference because um, the temperature rise from 1690 to 1750 was far steeper and higher than anything we've seen today. It was because of this massive rise in TSI over that short time period. This is beryllium-10 isotope, which is a solar flux proxy, and we went back 300 years here. As you can see, um, solar activity was very low. It's around 1700. Then 1750 it was quite reasonable, and then a slow increase, you could say, with variations over time since then. So the, but the biggest increase was from 1700 to about 1750, 60 uh, in solar activity. So you could say uh, starting from 1750 is kind of a cherry pick, really. Then we've got temperature adjustments and hockey sticks. So the third assessment report from the IPCC, men's hockey stick. It's been cold since then. Uh, he reconstructed temperature over the last thousand years using tree ring proxies, which are not 
a very accurate method of uh, finding a temperature because other things cause trees to grow and to not grow rather than temperature. Uh, and then on the end, it's tacked on this current data. So it's a no-no in science. You don't really tack on thermometer data to proxy data. It's, uh, if you do that, you should really emphasize it, but you shouldn't really do it at all. What's wrong with tree ring data? Now, this is a, a someone else did this work in the decade 2011. It shows proxy tree ring data in green over the last 2,000 years. You can see the much more variability in the um, other proxy data than the tree ring data. So tree ring, tree ring data are a bit uh, suspect, just like the CO2 ice core data is suspect. Now, talking about suspects, uh, this is work by Tony Heller. This is the BO, BOM data, Bureau of Meteorology data from Australia. From That's the entire record and adjusted. It was hot, very hot in the 1860s to 1900 period, hot, hotter than the present. Extensive bushfires, for example, and huge heat waves in the late 1800s. The fires were so intense in Victoria at that time that the stuff from the fires, the, the ash was falling on New Zealand. That's how intense the fires were. But this is the data that the Bureau of Meteorology sent to the global network of records. They cut it off in 1910. That's here. So they cut out all this warm period and sent the data only from 1910 to the present, which does show a warming. It does show warming from 19, slight warming from 1910 to now. But then, in orange, they adjusted the data and gave it more warming. So they more than doubled the warming that wasn't there in the original data. There was no warming. In fact, there was probably a cooling in the original data. That's probably the last, that's the last graph I was showing you. Other uh, other people responsible for collecting global temperature data, such as GIS, have adjusted their data. These adjustments are now being monitored, but they've only really been monitored since 1999. So what they did before that, we're not quite sure, probably something similar. But what the effect of the adjustments has done to GIS, it's, uh, it's cooled the past and it's eliminated any climate variability, uh, natural climate cycles, they've been eliminated and the later periods have been warm. So it's created a smoother, steeper temperature graph, which more accurately measures, uh, matches the, uh, the CO2 dead. Here, uh, I've put in the UH six, six the satellite, the entire University of Alabama at Huntsville uh, satellite data in green. You can see that the GIS temperature data is several times more warmer than it should be compared to the satellite data. NCDC, we've got the same story. Climate variability has been eliminated, so the warming of the 1880s, 1880 periods was, was cooled. Well, everything, basically everything before 1940 was, has been cooled to make the graph steeper. And then the 1940s period was changed as well. And later data has been warmed again to create the steeper grass. And had crooks have done the same thing. They've, all of the periods basically have been warmed. So they've smoothed the data and increased the steepness of the uh, grass. Okay, this is data from the oceans by Gorodsky, 2012. The ocean data, it was warm in 1980, cool in 1910, warm in 1940, cool in the 70s, and warm now. And the surface shows less change than, uh, than the near surface, but it was the warming from 1910 in the oceans to, to the 1940s. It's very similar to the warming from 70, 1975 to the current time. So... Um, and yet the IPCC say the last warming was caused by CO2 and the first warming wasn't. The deep ocean was warming far more from 1900 to 1940s than it has been doing recently. Here again, you could see the 60-year climate cycle, very prominent. And also underlying it, you can see, uh, well, we can't on this scale, but on other 
graphs, you can see the underlying longer term climate cycles. The Scotland temperatures for the last uh, 800 years, so going back to the year 1200, this is obviously a reconstructed proxy. So you can see climate cycles in here as well, although less climate cycles are less prominent on, on uh, local, in local areas than they are globally. But anyway, they're still visible. The temperatures in central England since 1659. And you just don't see any rapid increase due to uh, greenhouse gas emissions over the last 50 years or whatever. It's, it's just the normal climate cycles that, that happen everywhere. Lowe did a poll in Australia a few years ago to ask people how much are you ready to pay to stop climate change or to fight global warming. Unsurprisingly, more than 50% of people said uh, less than $100 a year. 40% of people said nothing. There's very few people, actually, it's only 3% of people who are ready to spend $2,000 a year to stop climate change. Those numbers have been getting worse for, for the CO2 proponents over the years. More people unwilling to spend even a cup of coffee a year to stop climate change. The problem is that most people in Australia don't know it, but they're already spending $1,500 per family per year, whether they like it or not, due to the climate actions that the government's taken, and uh, particularly in relation to climate taxes and, and energy changes. That's what it's costing. So people are in this category, whether they like it or not. The discussion really in climate is about what is the climate sensitivity? What happens if you double CO2 in the atmosphere or uh, the equivalent in greenhouse gases? The IPCC says you get a warming between 1.5 and 4.5 degrees centigrade. But not immediately. They say it takes place over uh, decades or even centuries. There's a few problems with that. The paper I published in 2018 shows that there's a terminal conflict between the ideal gas law and the greenhouse effect. For uh, the greenhouse effect to occur in a convecting atmosphere, which all atmospheres are convecting if the pressure is over 10 kPa, which means the tropospheres, the tropospheres in, uh, in planets. That's what we're talking about. So a large anomalous change must happen in the density, the pressure, or both. Uh, that's because of this formula. Why this formula dispro disproves the greenhouse gas hypothesis, as it's presented by the IPCC, is because there's said to exist a time delay to reach equilibrium, ECS, to CO2 being in that range of 1.5 to 4.5 centigrade. The IPCC report said that if there was a sudden doubling in the atmospheric greenhouse gas CO2, the greenhouse effect from this would operate slowly, causing an eventual 3 degrees centigrade of warming over centuries to millennia. Therefore, the claim is that the temperature would rise significantly over time with the same prevailing atmospheric concentrations and there would be no rapid equilibration but the ideal gas law demands that rapid equilibration. So therefore, there's a terminal conflict. There's no need to take into account the greenhouse gases in those, the atmosphere of those uh, planetary bodies to calculate the temperature. For example, Venus's um, temperature has been measured at 339 Kelvin at one bar, and you can calculate that temperature from the Earth. So the temperature of Venus equals... 1.1756, which is uh, the relative solar insulation, times the temperature of the Earth, and you get the temperature of Venus. So you can work out the temperature of the Venus atmosphere at one bar just from Earth, and TSI, the two things. And vice versa, you can work out the temperature of Earth from just knowing the temperature of the Venus atmosphere at one bar. So through TSI, so the temperature of Earth equals 0 0.85 times the temperature on, on Venus at 1 bar 339, which equals 288 Kelvin, which is, which is correct for the Earth temperature. Probably didn't explain that real well, but uh, that's the paper related to it. Okay, so that's the end of my presentation. Okay, thank you very much. That was great stuff. What do you think is going to happen to the global average temperature between now and either 2050 or 2100? Yeah, telling the future is a bit difficult, but as you, as you see from the climate cycles, our climate is still dominated by climate cycles, and all, as like it always was. 
Probably we'll see not a great deal of change. Could be a slight cooling between now and 2050, 60, and then a slight warming after that. That's what the climate cycles say. Okay, and where else can we find you on the internet? We can find you on Twitter at 1000 Frawley, right? Yeah, that's right. And also the same name, you can find me uh, on YouTube. I have quite a lot of uh, videos on climate change there, about 100, I think. Yeah. Very good. My message really is that uh, not to worry about CO2. Thanks again for doing this. No worries at all, Thomas. Thanks a lot.